Hello, everybody, and happy Halloween from Dr. Movie right here. I'm Rick. I'm your host here. I am the doctor of some sort. Not a real doctor, but hey, you know, it sounds cool. Makes for a good show name. Bringing you a new episode of a movie that I always think kind of gets overlooked, which is a lot of fun, from 1988 called Waxwork. It's really a great idea, or a really clever way of looking at an anthology, and I don't know, uh, just recently revisited and just kind of wanted to bring it to the show, and hopefully all of you that out there, if you've not seen this show, you need to check out Waxwork. It's a lot of fun. It's got that great 80s feeling that we all love, right? You got a bunch of rich college kids that really have nothing else better to do than to hang out and make fun of everybody, and you know, you can't wait for bad things to happen to these people, and that's kind of the whole premise of the story. Uh, you do have Zach Galligan in this, of course, from uh, the Gremlins fame, I guess you could say fame. We got the great David Warner in this as the bad guy. Nobody plays a bad guy as good as David Warner. He's just the best. And we got Deborah Foreman in here. She's the main girl from the movie Valley Girl, if you if you grew up watching that like I did. So, uh, and you also got Patrick McGee, not Patrick McGee, <laughs> Patrick McNee. Uh, Patrick McNee is from the original The Avengers TV show back in the 60s. Uh, he's one of my favorite characters in uh, Spinal Tap because he's Sir Dennis Eaton Hogg in that. And funny enough, he's Sir Wilfred in this movie. So the story is, these kids with nothing better to do. And they're all switching boyfriends and girlfriends. They're all sleeping around with each other, kind of like expected in the in these days. And uh, a couple of girls are walking, I guess, to school, college, whatever, the next day. And they pass this building, and there's a sign on it that says Waxworks. And uh, David Warner standing out in the front and invites them to come back at midnight and to bring no more than six people with them. Uh, so, you know, they're kind of freaked out. And uh, they convince some of their friends. So there's there's a lot of banter back and forth between these kids because uh, our main character Mark is in love with a girl named China, and apparently she's just a slut sleeping around with everybody, and uh, kind of messes him up. But they decide to go to this waxwork at midnight, and <laughs> you got. A girl that's not used to being out and, out and about. She's friends with China, and that's that's our uh, Sarah character. And uh, so these four people go in there. And what's cool about this is, of course, it's all these wax figures. It, it's it's a play from actually an old twenties movie called Waxwork as well. It kind of takes from that idea, a German film. And uh, they. Uh, see these exhibits, and if you get too close and you cross the barriers that they have there, you go into whatever the scene is. And the first one is really cool. Uh, John Reese Davis is in it. And this guy, and, and what's funny is when they go in, they're still who they are. They still talk the same way. They're not being changed into whatever timepiece this is. They get dressed like the timepiece, but they are still very much 80s kids. And, you know, the first guy goes in, and it's a werewolf scene. And you get a pretty cool transformation here. The effects in this movie are, I'm going to say, they're really, really good practical effects for the time. Um, and it's fun. This is a fun movie. But he goes in here, and John Reese davis changes into a werewolf and bites him. And so you start getting another transformation of this new guy. And these people come in and, you know, kill the werewolves, shooting silver bullets, all that kind of stuff. And as soon as he dies, the scene backs away, and now he is part of the wax, you know, scene that they have set up in, in the wax works. So that's a cool way to do this anthology kind of thing. And you're hitting, you know, all the all the big hitters of, of you know, folklore horror, right? Uh, the second one, China goes into, she's attracted to the, the Dracula figure that's standing there, and she gets too close, gets pulled in. And she's playing the part where 
they're sitting at the dinner table with Dracula, and he says that, uh, sorry that her fiancé couldn't be there, got tied up doing something else, <laughs> literally tied up. Uh, they force her to eat, and of course she's eating probably even her fiancé, who knows. But she's definitely not eating pork roast, <laughs> all right? So you go through this whole ordeal of her being uncomfortable and being surrounded by all these people on the table who are all vampires, but they don't really reveal that just yet. You already know it because you know how the story goes. But later on, the son of Dracula starts hitting on her like he wants him for herself, and she's not that interested. She's more interested in the big guy. And uh, she runs away from the son and finds her husband strapped down to a table, and his leg has been eaten off. It's down to the bone. And she's talking to him, and then a rat comes up and is, like, starting to chew on his leg, and he's screaming and stuff. So there's a big play on him missing the, the leg, and everything that happens, somebody touches his leg, and he screams incredibly, you know. So, again, it's the gross-out and fun-at-the-same-time type of movie. Uh, needless to say... She ends up killing Dracula's son, doing away with the brides of Dracula, but she just can't get away from Dracula himself and ends up being succumbed to him. And then when it backs away again, she's laying down and he's approaching her to bite her on the neck. And that's the waxwork, you know, scene there. So this just keeps moving on and on and on. There's other people getting introduced. So you got two people that are missing now. And uh, at that point, Mark and Sarah leave. And they go back. Mark's making phone calls because China didn't come home. He even calls her parents. That's the other thing I love about the 80s movies. Parents just don't care. They don't care if their kids come home. They don't pay attention to anything that's going on. They're oblivious to any kind of, you know, any kind of situation going on. This has a very Fright Night kind of feel to it, if you know what I mean. This movie is kind of piggybacking off of that. But with this cool anthology idea. And uh, he goes to the cops takes the cops back to the waxwork during the day. They do some looking around, and they can't really find anything. And uh, so the cop goes back, and then later on that day, he's thinking about, he's brought up a case earlier where he was talking to, to Mark about all these murders have been happening, people disappearing, and they can't find anybody, no clues. Well, he starts realizing in his head, he starts seeing people that were laying there that were in these scenes that were the people that were missing. So he decides to go back and do some more investigating. And when he does, he crosses over into a story, and it's The Mummy. And, and this mummy is awesome, man. He comes out, you know, pretty much they, they open a tomb, and there's a curse, of course. And The Mummy comes out, steps on a dude's head, smashes it flat, uh, kills the, the main professor that's there, and then... Picks up the, the police officer and then his, I guess, girlfriend that's in this scene because, again, you're thrown into this situation. Throws them both into the casket in, or the tomb and then closes it back up, leaving them there to rot forever. Uh, again, it's hitting all the big hitters of the time. At this point, uh, Mark and Sarah decide to go back in <clears throat> and... Sarah is enthralled by Marca de Sade. So she sees him standing there. So this girl apparently is a virgin, never never, never been around a guy or anything like that. And Mark likes her and even tries to kiss her. She's like, I'm not interested in it. I'm looking for something different. Needless to say, she's looking for some heavy hitting stuff, apparently. So she goes in, gets tied up. This dude's whipping her, beating her, almost beats her to death. And she wants him to keep going. While that's going on, Mark is falling into, well, I'm going to say falling. The, I don't know if you say the door greeter. The door greeter of the Wax Works place is like three foot tall. You've seen him in a lot of stuff. Very, very popular in the roles that he plays in. And then there's also like a lurch looking dude too that, I don't know. I don't know if they just threw that in there for contrast or what. But anyways, the little guy pushes Mark into like a Night of the Living Dead type scene. It's even in black and white. And this is where he realizes that when you are in these sets, there are borders, and you can literally push your way back through and get back out. You just don't, you can't see the border. 
And then he starts realizing that so much of it is in your head. The more that you're scared of this, then, you know, that's how these things really happen. But as long as you believe that none of it is real, they can't really hurt you. So needless to say, he escapes the Night of the Living Dead scene, jumps into the Market de Sade scene, and goes and saves Sarah and gets her out. But she doesn't want to go. She wants to stay. He even un, 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 hang, hang, unhangs. <laughs> he even uh, gets her loose from whatever it was, the handcuffs, I think. And when he gets her loose, she runs and grabs Market de Sade's leg and stays with him. She doesn't want to go. So at that point, he makes them realize that this is all fake. It's not real. Marcus Desaad comes up and tries to slash him, and it goes right through him. He tries to shoot him, and he can't shoot him. So Mark's making his point. He grabs Sarah. They jump out. And then you're having uh, a big showdown because David Warner later on in the story really makes you realize what, what's really going on here. He has to fulfill all of these waxworks. In order for this thing to happen on a certain day at a certain time, and it releases all the evil in the earth, and all the dead will rise up and take over the world. So he's, you know, totally a uh, opportunist. And that's his plan, and he's down to making it all complete. He finds a couple of other kids to come in while they're standing there, and they do. They get in there, and same deal. They get swapped in. So next thing you know... All these characters are coming alive for real and coming into the real world. And earlier, we find out that David Warner's character, David Lincoln in the movie, uh, killed Mark's grandfather back in the day. And this was all due to some kind of evil. And they were all messing around with witchcraft and stuff. And that's where uh, Sir Wilfred is involved, too, because Sir Wilfred was also involved with Mark's grandfather, so he knows who David Lincoln is, and he's been searching for him. And all this is going on. All these characters start coming alive. And then Cyril Wilfred shows up in his wheelchair with a whole big mob of people coming in there. So we got hand-to-hand -hand combat between classic horror, or, uh, you know, classic horror figures fighting off with these normal people. And, of course, you've got... You know, people shooting werewolves with silver bullets and everything. It's just a big throwdown. It's pretty awesome. There's even a hand roaming around from the Night of the Living Dead scene. It's just a severed hand. It's crawling around everywhere. And when it comes down to it at the end, Mark has a big face-off with uh, Desaad and beats him. And then all of a sudden, David Warner's up top, and he's got a gun, and he's going to shoot both Mark and Sarah. And before he does, Sir Wilfred hits Lincoln with something. I don't even know what it was. I couldn't tell. I don't know if he shot him. I think he shot him. But it just happened so quick. So he falls off a balcony and into the big bat of wax, right? So now he's going to be a figure, I guess. Again, kind of going back to the original House of Wax movie, that kind of same scenario happens. So it's paying homage to a lot of this stuff. Needless to say, the kids get out. Uh, Sir Wilfred gets eaten by a werewolf, and the kids get out, and they set the whole place on fire, which is supposed to make an end to all of it. But on the way out, you see the severed hand make its way out, so the evil is still out there. Now, does it start all over? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see, because there is a waxwork, too. <laughs> we'll follow that up pretty soon. But I have to say, if you like... All the 80s movies, Reanimator, Evil Dead 2, this one fits in nicely with those types of movies. It's a lot of fun, really good effects, good acting, and just a well-made film and such a clever idea to take the anthology idea and turn it on its head. It's a lot of fun, so I highly encourage you to go check out Waxwork. As a matter of fact, you can find it on Tubi, which is where I'm pulling a lot of stuff here lately. So get on that Tubi train. Check out Waxwork. Till then, folks, this is Dr. Movie. We will check you later.